Hi, I'm doing this video in response to an email I got from a, a viewer about an article that was written a long time ago, 1975, by me on Trotsky's transitional program. And the guy was asking me to what extent I still agreed with what was in the program. It, not in the program, in my critique of the program. Now, if you want to look up the article, there's the link to it, and I'll try and put a, a copy of that up on the um, YouTube comment area. Now, the article I wrote back in 1975 was very critical of the transitional program. I said that the transitional program, which was the program drawn up by Trotsky for his so-called Fourth International, um, couldn't really be considered a valid model for a Marxist program. It's actually a Lafargist program rather than a Marxist program, and I'll explain that later. The problem is that a program at the very beginning needs to be aware of the contradictory combination of modes of production that make up the world economic system and the contradictions that arise from these and the interests of the different classes that uh, originate from that as well. The problem is the transitional program of Trotsky doesn't even contain any scientific characterization of capitalism and its internal contradictions. Far less does it attempt to explain the interrelationship between the various modes of production which still existed at that time and still exist to some extent now in different parts of the world then, semi-feudal, capitalist, state capitalist and socialist, etc., which existed then. Now, it says, the economic prerequisite of the proletarian revolution has already in general achieved the highest point of fruition that can be achieved under capitalism. Mankind's productive forces stagnate. Already new inventions fail to raise the level of material wealth. Well, that kind of formulation will be familiar to anyone who reads Trotsky's papers. They continue to follow very much this sort of conception. It sounds impressive, but the, you have to ask, is it true? Well, was it even true then? Well, obviously not. It wasn't true then. Um, the facts are quite contrary to it. Even the first sentence was false 40 years later when I wrote my article. Trotsky implied that capitalism was already the predominant mode of production throughout the world. But this is preposterous. There were large areas of the globe in Asia, Africa, Latin America where small-scale pre-capitalist production was with accompanying feudal or even pre-feudal relations of production still existed. So to say that the highest level of productive forces that could be achieved under capitalism had already been achieved when applied to the world was ridiculous. But worse than that, even applied to the developed world, it was quite wrong. He was saying this just before a massive rate of growth of the capitalist world. I have drawn in red the what Madison calls the Western offshoots. He means the Anglo settler colonies, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. The this is GDP per capita. Blue is Western Europe. The vertical line is when Trotsky wrote his transitional program. As you can see, he writes it just before a long period of rapid capitalist growth. Now, this is a, a more rapid rate of growth than had been achieved in the previous, um, almost the previous century. Well, the figures don't go back the previous century. Let's say the previous 75 years. So far from being at an end of 
technical development, it was at the start of a very rapid rate of technical development. And even if you zoom in on the time axis here, well there had been this big recession in 29 to 33. But he was writing this in 1938, five years after the recession had ended. He was writing this during the upswing, upswing both in America and in Europe. He was writing this at a point when the economies had been growing for five years. Now, the other thing is, when you make a general statement about that, like that, about the highest level of fruition that can be possibly achieved under capitalism has already been reached, you're ignoring most of the world. You're ignoring India, China and Africa. Now let's look at India. Well, it's true. At the time he wrote here, India was undergoing decline. Was that because India had reached the highest level of development of the productive forces that capitalism allowed? Or was it due to British imperial oppression of India? Because in 1948 India becomes independent and what happens? You start seeing a recovery of the Indian economy once it's no longer having to pay tribute to Britain. So the idea that productive forces had reached their full development in India was obviously ridiculous. Now, one of the questions, one of the questions that the viewer asked me was, he said something, he's referring to my 1975 article, that's not addressed is the role of the destruction of the productive forces that occurred in World War II and the importance that this had for bringing capitalism to a new stage of accumulation. This is a favourite story that the Trotskyists tell themselves as to why Trotsky was wrong. Their theory is Trotsky was right all along, capitalism had reached its highest stage of development in 1938, then the war came, destroyed a lot of capital equipment, the destruction of the capital equipment meant it had to be replaced and that explains the post-1945 period of expansion. Now is it a valid point? How much does it actually explain? Well let's look at the, look at the data again. It's not an explanation for the USA and Canada or Australia. These were at the forefront of the, the boom in the post-war period, had the highest standards of living, and they had suffered no war damage at all. The United States and Canada were not bombed. They didn't have their factories destroyed. So there was no capital loss that could be explained as a, a cause of the rapid growth. Now, if we look at Western Europe, well, there is a big decline in living standards in the last years of the war, which is not surprising due to the economic disruption that bombing and warfare caused. And then there was growth after that. At the most, you could say it took until the end of the 50s, about here, for Europe to recover to where it would have been had there been no war and production had continued under peacetime conditions at the same rate as before. But growth didn't stop at the end of the 1950s. It continued. It continued until just before the 1980s at a rapid rate. So the explanation that it was replacing wartime losses replacing wartime capital stock is an implausible explanation. It says there's something basically wrong with the economics that informed Trotsky's writing in 1938. Now you have to look in slightly more detail at the structure of national income. 
The qualitative difference between the 1930s and the post-war period was that the share of GDP going in household consumption fell and the share of GDP going on government expenditure and gross capital formation rose. Um, if we, oops, go back. If we look at this, this is the share of GDP made up of household consumption. This is government consumption. Now, obviously, government consumption shoots up during the war and then drops off sharply. The red is gross capital formation. Well, there's a deficit in gross capital formation during the war. OK. But the long term trend is for government expenditure and gross capital formation to level off at roughly twice the level they had been before. In the 1930s, they varied between about 5% and 10%. From the, the late 1950s each of these was around 10 percent or more there's a decline in household consumption because what we're computing here is household consumption as a share of gross domestic product and gross domestic product ignores depreciation a long period of capital accumulation as occurred in the um, post-war period, builds up the capital stock and therefore more of it depreciates each year. And therefore part of the, the decline in household consumption there is accounted for by increased depreciation.